Hi, I'm Mackenzie Fagan, and this is 112BK, coming to you from downtown Brooklyn. Book tours are all fun and games until white supremacists show up. Nazis ruin everything. Jonathan Metzl is here to talk about dying of whiteness. I think what was what was particularly concerning about this event, but many many bookstores, many um, book fairs are being are getting similar protests, is how emboldened people are. They're coming out without any masks or anything like that, because there's a sense that basically they're part of something much bigger, and that nobody's going to reprimand them or go after them. a working class white guy who lives in Tennessee. Let's call him Ron. Ron has some medical debt, his house is in a flood zone, and he lives in fear that his blue collar job, which only barely supports his family, is going to disappear. Does Ron have more in common with a working class African American who lives one county over, or a highly educated white one percenter? How the Rons of America answer that question has a direct impact on their life expectancy. That may seem like a leap of logic, but in Jonathan Metzl's new book, Dying of Whiteness, he presents research that shows that many Americans are shortening their own lives by voting against their own best interests. And it's all because of white fragility. Unsurprisingly, not everyone has been psyched about his conclusions. Months ago on this show, Jonathan, who directs the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt University, talked about the book in advance of its release, but we've asked him back to share his thoughts on its polarizing reception. Jonathan, welcome back. Thanks. It's really great to be back. So in case people missed our previous episode where we talked about your book and the conclusions it draws, tell me a little bit about it. What is the premise? I I think you actually very well summarized what this book is about. It was basically a book about what happens to you if you're a white working class American and you live in a state, for example, that blocks the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion, that enacts massive tax cuts that benefit very wealthy people, but undermine roads, bridges, and schools schools in your own state. And what I found is that these policies, these policies that are core GOP policies that are supposed to make white America great again, end up making even working class white lives harder, sicker, and shorter. Um, I I tracked the history of these policies, and I found really that what was happening was, on one hand, people felt like they were winning, winning the culture wars, but they were doing so at a cost, and that's really the story uh, story of the book. So it may be making America great again, but it's also making lives shorter again. Basically, if you're a white working class person and you live in a state that, for example, didn't expand Medicaid, uh, as one example, um, that policy itself was as dangerous to your health as was asbestos or not wearing a seatbelt in a car or secondhand smoke. It literally served as a risk factor that shortened your lifespan. And so part of the story I tell in the book is why is it that working class people support policies that are so bad for their own their own health and longevity? But you're not a philosopher because all this sort of seems philosophical, right? You're a medical doctor. So how did you go about proving this? What data did you look at? Well, partially it was about me going across the South and Midwest and talking to people. So the core story of the book are focus groups uh, and and personal interviews. I went through Kansas, Missouri, and Tennessee, and I talked to people about issues ranging from the Affordable Care Act and how they felt about it, to very liberal gun policy, what it meant to have guns everywhere, to massive tax cuts. So the core of the the core of the story are these people's lives, and I'd be happy to talk about it because the things I found in these interviews were remarkable. But then the next level, because I'm a policy and medical person, is I then went to big databases to tell the story that I was just saying. In other words, what was the broad societal impact of these particular policies? And that's where I found the most really the most shocking evidence. For example, one database story that I told was that if you're a white American and you lived in Tennessee that blocked the Affordable Care Act, you had about a two to three week shorter lifespan because the whole medical system of the state was undermined by by this act. And so really at the core, it's a story that links people's stories and narratives and history with these these bigger data d- data stories. And are you comparing, say, the data from Tennessee with a state like Massachusetts that has universal health care and maybe tighter gun laws? Mm-hmm. So let's take the Affordable Care Act as one example. So the research that I did first started with talking to people about the Affordable Care Act. 
And the stories that I found about why people would would reject the Affordable Care Act in Tennessee were pretty remarkable. Some people didn't trust government, but a number of people really gave me their answers in profoundly racial terms. Um, I'll never forget one focus group that we did. Um, I was with um, some of my students, and we had men around a table, and a very, very medically ill man, white man, uh, came to this group in a low-income housing project, and he clearly needed medical attention. This man was literally dying from liver failure. And I said, gosh, having Medicaid expansion might actually be helpful to you. And he said, I know I would benefit myself but I don't want to be part of a system where the benefits are going to Mexicans and welfare queens. That was the story he told me. And so this story of minorities and immigrants are gaming the system, and so I'm not going to participate, really was a very common thread. So all we did in the data part of the book then was compared Tennessee to Kentucky, 25 minutes away by car from where the focus groups were happening. And basically what the data showed was that if you just lived 25 minutes away, um, you would pay less for your prescriptions. Um, people like this medically ill man would have more access to physicians, be part of a better, more vibrant medical system. And so the question of even seeing what was happening across state boundaries, literally like you know less than a half an hour drive away, people were still holding on to this mistrust of government and this fear that minorities were gaming the system. I mean, it seems that ideology is more appealing to people than prolonging their lives by two to three weeks, right? That like white supremacy is the new smoking, where it's like we know that it kills us, but it feels so good. Well, I think think it's a good way to put it. I mean, I'll say in all fairness, I think for a lot of people that I talked to, they felt like they were putting their lives on the line for a cause. And so I do think that that's something that many liberals like myself missed going in was how committed people on the ground were to these bigger ideals. Now, I personally might not agree with many of the, these ideals, but when I asked people, when I would say, hey, look, the Affordable Care Act could really help you, and they'd be like, yeah, I know that, but what's more important to me is that we have a Republican in the White House, we end up um, having a conservative Supreme Court, abortion is legal. So they were literally like laying down on the tracks. And so for them, they were winning the elections, which I think was a pretty powerful, a pretty powerful motivator for them. But at the same time, it was at at this profound cost, not just to themselves, but to the entire the entire system, started to fall apart. And again, the Affordable Care Act is a good example. You know, when when people are sicker, when they're uninsured, the in- people end up going to the emergency room. They're much sicker. The entire healthcare system of the state suffers. And so, they were willing to basically bring down the structure of the entire state rather than create a system that was more equitable. It sounds like they're sort of the foot soldiers for this ideology, and they're willing to lay down literally in their own lives. I was trying to understand people. I wasn't trying, you know, because honestly, at the end of the day, I'm from Kansas City. I live in Tennessee. I want there to be a better healthcare system. I want people to feel more secure. I want there to be better dialogue. Um, but I guess the irony for me, one of the main ironies of writing this book, was that if conservative people who were working class stopped um, identifying with the wealthy one percent and more with you know their neighbors who were um, you know African American or Latino or other kinds of things. In other words, if they if they started saying yes, I'm a conservative Republican, but I also want a good healthcare system. I also want good schools. The minute conservatives start saying that, the entire GOP platform falls apart because they can't do tax cuts for for wealthy people basically. Right. And so the really the the whole superstructure of the GOP of the GOP platform depended on white working class people literally putting their lives on the line in sometimes in opposition not only to their own economic self-interest but also their own biological self-interest right and this sort of identification with other white people even if that white person is the former head of goldman sachs sort of supersedes any notion of um, a class-based struggle or having something in common with your neighbor who may be of a different race right there's a, there's a whole there's a whole system that i came to understand in which you know because r- really part of what i found in my research was that so many of these issues, anti-Obamacare, pro-gun, anti-immigrant, they were not just policy issues, they were identities. And so in a way, it, it's in other words, to be anti-Obamacare was what it meant to be conservative, what it meant to be white in a lot of the areas. And so this depth of ideology really created this, what felt to them, I think, like resonance between poor working class people in the South and people who would seem to have nothing in common with their best interests. And it also separated them from their neighbors. And this, of course, has been 
a story, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about this in his famous work about after Reconstruction. Why is it that poor white people don't join forces with poor black people? They could extract all these great concessions um, from the elites. Uh, and the, his answer was that there was a wage of whiteness, and I, I found that that wage was still pretty, pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. So you're drawing some pretty difficult conclusions that your racism is killing you and that you're being duped by the system. How do you get people to listen to this without immediately their hackles going up? Well, I'm, I'm trying to create a, 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 a conversation, and I will say honestly that I, I don't think people are being duped. Uh, and, and so part of the argument in the book was not about the wool being pulled over people's eyes. It was, I mean, because, for example, many of the people I spoke with were very knowledgeable about the Affordable Care Act, much more so than other people I know in my in my own social life. Um, and, and that was true across the board. I think people, it's not like people didn't know. They, were, they knew and they made a choice. And so the story I was asking was, how do they... How do you get people to make choices like this that are seemingly so at odds with them? And part of the answer I gave was that it wasn't just about the particulars of policy. It was about this much bigger story about race and really the construction of whiteness. Now, I will be honest that um, I have many conservative friends. I have many friends who are evangelical, who are Trump supporters, who we get along in not areas outside of politics, you know, play softball together, go to work together, things like that. And so I've had many very productive conversations, many incredibly productive conversations um, about how can we come together? And I've started to think in my own mind about possible questions that we can create to form some middle ground. But the, the problem is, you know, for me, like, the Nazis get all the news and the controversy gets all the news and it seems like it's this totally extreme thing. And I, I, I guess part of the issue is I want to say, look, there's a center if we can just talk to it in a particular way, but that's not the way the media is. That's not the way, of course, books like mine are received right, right. now. Right. I mean, it is sort of easier for me to understand because it's an idea of ideology versus pragmatism in mm -hmm. many ways. And as a progressive, I find that idea easy to relate to, that there are ideological um that, that there's ideology that maybe I would sacrifice, sacrifice myself for. That ideology isn't white supremacy, um, but at least I can sort of understand where people are coming from. Right, and I mean, it's, I don't think it's comparable, right? Because, I, again, I'm a race scholar, so for me that's front and center. But, I mean, you can, you know, we... Democrats vote for people who raise our taxes, which might seem antithetical to somebody else. We um, vote for people who might help other people more than ourselves, things like that. And so there are things that probably might not make sense. I, again, I don't think there's a moral equivalent because I think right now the GOP policies are literally killing people by taking away their health care um, and, and undermining school systems and factors like that. Um, so I don't think it's a moral equivalent, but I, but I would also say that there is hopefully some level of self-reflection um, where, where we say, um, you know, our politics have so become so aligned with our identities, and maybe that's time for us to step back and think about uh, other, other, kinds of, other kinds of questions we might ask. So, Jonathan, you've been on a book tour. <laughs> Anything new lately? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, not today. <laughs> so you were on a book tour. You were on your book tour, and you were um, in a bookstore in Washington, D.C. Tell us about what happened. I was giving a talk at the Politics and Prose bookstore on Saturday. And ironically, the reason I was in D.C. was that I was at this remarkable anti-racist book festival that was taking place in, in D.C. over the weekend where all these brilliant figures who talked about how can we address racism in this country came. And then I, I went that afternoon to give a talk at, at the Politics and Prose bookstore. And it was a beautiful spring day in D.C. It was a packed house of people who came to hear me talk about the book. And as I'm giving the talk... Um, it, it was actually quite um, ironic and tragic. My father escaped um, the, the Holocaust from Austria, and he only made it to this country because of the generosity of strangers who came and supported him and helped him. And so a man in his 80s who was one of my father and my grandparents' hosts from this country was in the audience. And wow. at the moment in my talk, I was saying, here's an example of how America can be really great when we're our most confident, when we're our most generous, when we're our most powerful, when we stand up for people in need and strangers. Look what it brings to our country. It brings all this greatness, all this energy, all this vibrancy. And at that moment, I look up, and there are nine men and one woman um, who are apparently not of the crowd, and I could tell that because they were marching in in formation. The guy in front had a bullhorn. Um, they just 
were not there to make friends in a way, and they marched to the front and they held a, a white supremacist neo-Nazi rally in front, in, you know, in front of me, basically, kind of commandeered the space for about five or ten minutes, did a bunch of chants, it got captured on video. This is not equivalent at all, but there was a, you know, a, a terrorist shooting, a white terrorist shooting in, in a synagogue in California. On the um, same day. Two doors down was um, Comet Pizza, where there had been a shooting um, earlier. And so there was a moment of, oh my God, is that happening here? And then it was clear that this was a, you know, this was a peaceful publicity stunt, stunt in a particular way. Um, people in the audience first were shocked and then they started booing. The men did, and women did their chants. They did their little, it was very, they'd clearly been practicing. Um, then, then they left and then we had a, you know, I said, look, this is not a talk anymore. We're, we all experienced something together. So I just opened the mics and we had a conversation about what kind of country do we want right now? And what does this mean? And how can we push back on this? Because this doesn't represent us. So it turned into a Pretty meaningful experience, but as I said, there there were there was a videographer who happened to catch the whole thing on on video um, in the crowd, and and then things took off from there. And we actually will show a little clip of that video right now. Please. You would have the white working class trade their homeland for handouts, but we, as nationalists and identitarians, can offer the workers of this country a homeland, their birthright, in addition to healthcare. Good jobs and so forth. This land is our land. 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 Get in the morning. I mean, it's remarkable. They seem like toddlers throwing a tantrum. Like, it, it seems very rehearsed, as you mentioned. And the moment when they're like, all right, like, guys, it's time for the chant right now. And all of a sudden, their necks bulge and they're, you know, pounding their fists. It's, um, I mean, it looks, it looks both frightening and humorous. Right, right, right. And again, you know, that's the thing. You don't know if it's frightening or humorous. I would, I would say that the thing to take seriously um, is that previously, I mean, there have always been people with these ideologies in our country that, that predates our country, and it's certainly been a strain uh, throughout. But the issue is usually, usually when stuff like this rears its head, it's like, okay, you're expressing this, but we have higher authorities in this country. We have the office of the president. We have the Justice Department, places that kind of step in and say, no, this is not this is not our, our society. We're better than that. And I think what was what was particularly concerning about this event, but many many bookstores, many um, book fairs are being are getting similar protests, is how emboldened people are. They're coming out without any masks or anything like that, because there's a sense that basically they're part of something much bigger, and that nobody's going to reprimand them or go after them the way the way the Justice Department of the presidency would have before. And they have the explicit approval of the executive office. For, I mean, you know, that that's that's pretty much it. That when you don't come out and condemn uh, condemn something like Charlottesville that that in a way what happens is it gives free reign um, for the these kind of uh, events to unfortunately happen more frequently. So would something like that ever happened to you before and what's happened in the wake of this in-person protest? Well again I just want to be clear that I've had many, since my book came out it's been about uh, two months now I've had remarkable conversations mm -hmm with Republican politicians, with people who might not agree with me politically about how can we form common ground. And so I, I first want to say that even though this thing got all the headlines, that's not been my experience of writing the book. My experience has actually been pretty positive. I've that's gone good to on, hear. I've gone on conservative talk radio. I've gone on ministry television. I've had what I feel like are the kind of conversations that I that I wanted to have. But since this thing happened, you know, I, I guess the debate that ultimately happens then is about identity, is this white nationalism, what does it mean to be white? And I, of course, contributed to that by writing an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, two days ago about how, okay, this thing came to my doorstep, I wasn't asking for it, but it does it does create an opening for us to talk about what whiteness means. And part of what I'm, I'm saying is there are many ways to be white in this country. And even though people like me aren't usually, or had, I didn't go into this comfortable with talking about 
whiteness or white identity. And usually before this, I would have said, no, I'm a scholar of policy, but I don't think that's an acceptable position anymore. And so part of the point I made in the Washington Post piece, and I'm going to continue making, is unfortunately we're being presented with a model of what whiteness isn't or shouldn't be. President Trump is giving it his, his approval. Protesters like this are saying, here's what it means to be white in America. But to counteract that, you can't just protest against it. You actually have to say, here's, whiteness isn't that, it's this. And I think it's time for white Americans of conscience to speak up and say, we reject that formation of whiteness. Um, we, we, we're for racial justice. There are formulations of whiteness that are also much more generous and brave and community oriented and take care of strangers and people in need, religious traditions, political traditions. So it's time for us to basically stand up and say that doesn't represent us, but here's what does. You really laid out in this op-ed that up until fairly recently, white Americans didn't really have to think about whiteness in the yeah. same way that black people had to think about blackness, for example. Um, and I, I remember the refrain for a while with gay pride parades was always like, well, there's no straight pride parade. You know, there's no white pride parade. It's like, well, those are called Nazis. You know, there's no white history month because it's all of the months. Um, and it sounds like we're in sort of this moment of reckoning where all of a sudden white people are being confronted with the notion of some type of collective whiteness and that we're at an inflection point. Like, do the Charlottesville uh, clan members get to co-op whiteness or do we get to rely on some of these other uh, traditions of whiteness that are about generosity or helping people like your your father, your grandfather? My, my grandparents and my father mm -hmm. uh, came. So yes, yeah, so strangers helped them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right. You know, in a way, part of the privilege of white uh, of whiteness has been not needing to reflect about it, right? We didn't, we never had to define what it was. And so what that meant is we don't really have a language for times like now to articulate what whiteness is in addition to what whiteness isn't. And and I think that's what's happening now is this, this is, it's forcing us to have that conversation. The other point, of course, is that at the same time, whiteness is everywhere. So we have a lot of proxy conversations, right? The immigration debate is really not about immigrants. It's about white anxiety. Many parts of the gun debate are about protecting yourself from the racial other, which tells you a lot about whiteness. Um, tax cuts, I can go down the list. Um, vaccines, maybe, all these things. And so we're having a lot of proxy conversations about whiteness. And part of what I tried to say in, in that piece um, is let's just, let's just talk about what is really going on here. There's a, there's a kind of <laughs> white elephant in the room uh -huh. <laughs> that we're not talking about. And so I, I think that in a way that it's really time for us to do so. So Joe Biden recently announced his candidacy with a quite remarkable campaign video. It's three and a half minutes. He doesn't say anything about his own achievements, doesn't say anything about his platform. It's all about white nationalism and the wake of Charlottesville. I'm curious about your read on that video. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's an important time, and I think it's important front and center, and I think it's important for politicians of conscious, Democratic and Republican, to reject this reject this formulation. So in that sense, I thought that it was actually a pretty good first step, because I happen to know um, that there are many people on all sides who, even though they might disagree about policy, are kind of sickened by many of the things that are happening right now. And so I think it's an appeal to common sense in the middle. And it'll be interesting to see what happens if that gets co-opted by some of these extreme elements. But I did think that it was important to bring this question of, of race back to the center of the campaign because I think to that point it hadn't it hadn't been. But I also again think the onus is also on Republicans, right? I mean, I think that part of the issue here is um, nobody benefits by this kind of extremism happening in our country right now. And so, um, you know, if there's some way to bring race to the center of m bigger debates, obviously, 2020 is obviously, obviously very charged. But I did think it was a, I did think it was an important move by Biden. I thought it was a powerful video, and you're right. I would be really interested to see would a Republican release that same video. We're just saying that Nazis suck. It doesn't seem that controversial, right? And it seems like in an earlier time, you might have had some sort of centrist John McCain, um, Lindsey Graham 1.0 releasing something similar and nobody would bat an eye. Right. No, I mean, that was that was part of what it meant to be an American. It wasn't a red or blue issue. And so, um, you know, I still hope for that. But I think right now it's obviously it's so hard and and partially partially that's about rejecting Nazis, but it's also about making appeals for working class people, right? In other words, how can you be a Republican 
and have your policy for your party be undermine a national health care system without any plan for how you're going to replace it and things like that. So it's also about taking care of people. Jonathan Metzl, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the book is called Dying of Whiteness. It's available everywhere. And I hope that you continue having more of the productive conversations that have really made up your experience so far and less of the white nationalist doofuses. Thanks so much. And that is the show for today. If you liked what you heard, the best way to show it is to curb your dog or review 112BK on iTunes. And please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.